Hartman from Donnebrook University. And the title is Wandering Lakes of Wada. Thank you very much, uh, Christoph. And um, thanks to the organizers um, for giving the opportunity to speak here, just to make sure you can all hear me. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Uh, so yes, yes um, you. I'll be talking about Wandering Lakes of Wada. And in particular, this is joint work uh, with David Montepeta and Lasser Rampa. Um, so what are these lakes of Wada? So the construction um, is generally as follows. So we start with some, you know, some vast ocean. We have some vast sea, which is some unbounded um, complementary domain that you can see here. And inside of this vast sea, what we have is an island. So we have this island here. And in this island, we have two lakes. We have a gray lake here and another lake here. And sometimes instead of these constructions, people can go somewhat wild and have these lakes filled with you know, um, honey or I mean, some alcohol, some wine, some beer, uh, and depending. But for now, we can just have them as regular old lakes. And on this island, um, we have some uh, villagers that live, say, on this island. And so these villagers are having a, a nice, happy life. And um, uh, they go about their day. But then one day, these people in the center of the island say, um, they think, well, it would be nice to have some maybe beachfront property or in general, some nice access to this um, vast unbounded uh, sea or ocean. And so these villagers, they're, they're very good at um, building, well, doing one thing and that's building canals. And so what do they do? Well, they build a canal so that now they're all within some nice distance of, um, on the island, they're all within some nice distance of the ocean. So we build some canal that say comes through here and say, comes through there. And yes, importantly, we want to be at some specific distance um, on the island from, um, from, the, um, uh, from the ocean. The, every point is at least within some specific distance of the ocean now. And so in doing this, we get a picture that looks like this for our first step in that we've made this canal um, that has nicely kind of split apart. Uh, uh, this island. And again, we now have um, some uh, villagers that say are here. And these villagers, again, um, for a little while, they're nice and content. They um, have nice access to the sea, um, which otherwise they would not have. But these villagers here at the bottom say, um, now before they were able to fairly easily access, say this gray lake that we have here. But now it's very difficult. They have to walk every day all the way around in order to get there. So they can't easily access this land. So what do they do? Well, they do what in a sense they do best and they build another canal. So they build a canal from here all the way around, all the way around. So that again, every point in the island is within uh, at least some specific distance of um, this lake and its extension. And in the end, we get a picture that looks like, well, like this, that uh, we've extended our lake to be with this long canal. And once more, these islanders, um, they're content for a little bit, and then suddenly they're not because of the fact that um, these islanders, before they used to be able to say, easily access this lighter gray lake, and now they can't. So again, what do they do? Well, they build another canal. And I won't draw this one too much because it gets very complicated, but um, we get something that looks like this figure. And so, um, Again, we specify that we would want that the islands within uh, some specific 
um, that every point in the islands within some small uh, specific distance of this lake. And in this limit, uh, we specifically want um, that this distance tends to zero when we introduce all these new canals. So in a sense, our land kind of disappears and what we end up with is um, some continua um, that bounds uh, each of all well, these three uh, domains here, the, um, the lake and his, the one lake and his extension, the other lake, the lighter one and its extension, and this unbounded sea. So this is the boundary of all three. And so just to reiterate, we start with some um, unbounded uh, domain here, the, the island, which is a bound domain that has, say, um, two simply connected um, domains within it. And we add these canals in each of these steps um, from first, um, say, the unbounded domain, and then from one lake, and then the other. And then we continue this process. Um, and so in the end, what we get is this lakes of water continuum, so called lakes of water continuum. So more formally, what do we have? Well, we're going to let D be an unbounded, simply connected domain. Uh, D here is going to basically be our island, more or less. And we're going to suppose that U and V are subsets of D. And so these guys are the lakes that we just talked about. And in particular, um, we want that uh, the closure of the one lake is a subset. Uh, the closure of both lakes is a nice subset of this island, um, and they have disjoint intersection. So then what do we get? Well, we obtain some sequences, these DNs, UNs, and VNs of some nice simply connected veins that are basically just what we talked about before. So we start off with our island with the lakes, the lakes, and then each time what we do is basically we remove some part of the island by taking some canal from the unbounded complementary uh, component. And we extend our lakes via these canals is what we're doing here. And so crucially when um, doing this operation and choosing the canals, what we want to do is we want to choose them so that the maximal distance um, from any point of, well, what's left of um, the actual land um, to the boundary of these complementary domains actually tends to zero. And so what happens is that in this limit, we get a compact connected set, which is the intersection of basically the closure of the island uh, minus um, the, uh, the lakes, basically. And so this is a lakes of water continuum. And more formally, um, we call a compact connected set X here, a lakes of water continuum. If the set X is the common boundary of three or more disjoint domains. And so here, what we've done for this construction is constructed uh, a lakes of water continuum, this guy, um, for which it's the boundary of exactly three, the two lakes and the unbounded one. Um, however, if one wanted to get more, um, you can see that basically what you do is that at each step, you just add another lake, say, and then um, continue this process. So I mean, right before um, uh, adding in another canal, um, here, what you do is just add another lake, say, and continue this process. And so, for instance, what one could have is a lakes of water continuum that bounds even infinitely many um, well, lakes. And so some history of these um, uh, continua. So this general construction first appeared in a paper by Yoniyama in 1917. And he attributed um, this method and this discovery uh, to his well, advisor at Takeo Wada. And so uh, Yoniyama's original construction actually only has two complementary components. You can see over here on the right, is from his paper in 1917. Here he again has the land, he has one single lake, and he has this unbounded sea. And he does the similar construction that extends this canal. And in fact, this question of whether or not 
you can have three or more domains can have the same boundary had actually been answered affirmatively by Brouwer uh, a few years earlier with a similar type of construction. So there's a little bit of history. So now we can ask, well, we have this construction. What does this look like, say, in the limiting case? And so a possibility is that it looks, say, like this. So here we have another example um, for which we have a lakes of water continuum that bounds while well, three simply connected bounded domains um, that we have in green, blue, and red. So here is simply active domain, here is, and here is, and the white, and they all have a common boundary, which is this lakes of water continuum that bounds all these guys. So, um, so this is generally uh, what um, possibly such a set would look like. And so um, these sets, I mean, they, they look, at, especially at first glance, um, to be rather pathological and rather I mean, messy sets. Um, but they occur, in fact, naturally in the study of um, dynamical systems in two real dimensions. So, for example, if one has um, the forced damped pendulum, so you think you have some pendulum, and uh, for instance, you run some current through in order to give it some force um, and also have the, um, some friction to dampen it, then basically what we get is that if you look at um, the basins of attraction of this dynamical system, then um, their boundaries are or have this property of being lakes of water continuum. Um, also, this is how we got the previous picture. Uh, and this is um, basically a, a projection of the so-called Plikken attractor, uh, which is uh, basically the attractor of some perturbation of a mapping of the torus that's been uh, projected to the plane. And so for a nice gnosis of the AMS article, let's look at um, Kudan's um, paper. And then um, lastly, our final example, our basins of attraction of some head-on maps in R2 also exhibit this behavior of having lakes of water continuum. Um, yes. So this brings up a natural question of whether or not um, lakes of water can actually occur in complex dynamics. So um, until now, it was not previously known whether these lakes of water continuum can actually occur non-trivially in one-dimensional complex dynamics. I say, I suppose, non-trivially, because, for instance, if the Julius sets the entire plane, then you can have whatever you want um, in that. If that makes sense. So, um, so this brings up our question, which is, can a lakes of water continuum uh, occur as the boundary of a two component of a holomorphic function? So not necessarily as the whole Julius set, um, but just as on the boundary of some component. And uh, we have this heavily related question, which is, that uh, which uh, was stated by Fatu, um, basically when he initiated the field um, in 1920, which is that if F has more than two for two components, can two of these components share the same boundary? And you can see here is the direct translation that we have, uh, depending on your French. And so this was asked in the case of rational functions. However, it, it makes equal sense uh, in the case of transcendental entire functions. And because of the fact that two really was only at this time uh, studying rational functions, and it would only be until 1926 that he'd um, have his paper on uh, general entire functions, um, that it would seem reasonable to say that basically, um, if he would have looked at transcendental entire functions before, he would have been uh, also interested in this question um, for transcendental entire functions. Okay, so then um, this leads us to uh, the main result, which is that there do exist, uh, there exists a transcendental entire function uh, with an infinite collection of the two components that all share the same boundary. And in particular, the Kalman boundary of all these for two components is a lakes of water continuum. So just to stress, what we do have is that lakes of water continuum 
do occur in complex dynamics, which was not previously known. So in particular, um, how do these um, lakes of water continuum occur? Well, the, the two components that we're looking at of uh, this function are going to be wandering domains. So um, we can choose the boundary of these two components uh, to be any lakes of water continuum. So it doesn't need to be some specific one. It can be basically any one uh, that you choose. But, uh, and in particular, this continuum is the boundary of infinitely many bounded, simply connected wandering domains. So what one can think of is perhaps like this picture. We have um, some lakes of water continuum that here, well, it bounds, I guess, three unbounded, simply connected uh, domains. And so you can think that uh, these, uh, this lakes of water continuum it is occurring, and each of these domains in uh, blue, red, and green are going to be these simply connected uh, wandering domains, bounded simply connected wandering domains. Is what you can think. So um, there are also some generally related problems in comics dynamics for which, I mean, related in the sense of whether or not these uh, lakes of water continuum can actually occur, um, two of which are Machianko's conjecture and a general question about whether or not the boundary of some of the two component can be a Jordan curve. So if we have a completely invariant component, U, And that is that the pre-image of U is in fact equal to U. And it's not too hard to show then that the boundary of U is in fact the whole Julia set. So in particular, the Julia set doesn't have any buried points. So Machianko's conjecture asserts the converse. So Machianko's conjecture says that if U is a two component of F and the boundary of U is the whole Julia set, then U is completely invariant under either F or uh, the second derivative of f. And you can think, so for example, um, this is z squared, you nicely have that, for instance, uh, the disk at the boundary of it is nicely the whole Julia set, and the disk is nicely completely variant under f. And the reason why, for instance, we need um, the second iterate is because you consider the rational map one over z squared is basically flipping the disk and the unbounded component. And this is why one needs the second iterate. And so um, this uh, conjecture was formulated basically as an analog of a similar result of Abakov for Kleinian groups in relation to the residual limit set of a Kleinian group. So it's Markyanko's conjecture. And next, um, we have a question, a general question, which is that if we have a bounded, completely invariant for two component U, is the boundary a Jordan curve? So if the function f that we're looking at is a polynomial, um, then it's known by results of uh, Roshan Yin that um, if we have an immediate basin of a finite attracting or parabolic periodic point, then it's going to be a Jordan domain. And also, uh, Dudko and Lyubich have announced um, the possibility of a proof uh, that the boundary of a Siegel disk of a quadratic polynomial is in fact a Jordan curve. So together with these two, um, if uh, this um, proof does hold, then this would rule out the existence of lakes of water boundaries in this family, so for quadratic polynomials. However, this could, uh, question remains open for polynomials of degree at least three. Uh, so now we'll move on to talking a little bit more uh, concretely, concretely about um, transcendental entire functions. And in order to do this, what we're going to do is introduce uh, well, the escaping set first, and then we'll talk a bit about wandering domains and things like this. But to begin with, uh, the escaping set of a transcendental entire function is to denote i of f, and it's the set of points for which the iterates f to the n tend off to infinity. As n, tends to off, uh, as, as n tends to infinity. And so here we have a nice example, which is um, a quarter times the exponential function. And so in black here, 
we have the escaping set, and I suppose um, we can't distinguish also the Julia set. Um, and in white here, we have the two set, uh, which is going to be um, some attracting basin, some basin attraction. So in general, here's an example of what the escaping set looks like um, for this map. And we have uh, what's called this candidate K of curves. So there's the escaping set. And so now we move on to talking a little bit about wandering domains. So if we have a transcendental entire function f, then uh, for two component u is called a wandering domain if f to the m of u intersected with f to the n of u is empty for all m not equal to n. So basically, this domain wanders and doesn't return back to itself. So uh, it's a famous theorem of Sullivan that wandering domains do not occur for rational functions. So that's why the definition has here transcendental entire is because they do not occur for rational functions. So the first example for transcendental entire functions was given by Baker. And um, wandering domains generally split up into uh, two different I suppose, classes in which we have very different behavior. So this um, uh, first class is uh, multi-connected wandering domains. So multi-connected wandering domains are always in the fast escaping set. So uh, points in them are always in the fast escaping set. Um, and they contain or eventually contain some very large annuli. So they eventually get very big um, with connectivity becoming either two or infinite. And in fact, if we have a multiply connected um, for two component, then it is going to be automatically wandering as a result of Baker. So there's been many other results um, uh, about multiply connected that there are many, many names, um, some of which are, for instance, um, results by Baker, Brookwell, Ripon, and Stollard, Zhang, uh, Kasaka, Shishikura, and um, recent results by Burkhardt and Zemek. Uh, and many, many others. So, um, so the other uh, class -ish of uh, wandering domains uh, are simply connected wandering domains, which we heard about this morning and um, by the previous uh, nice talk uh, by Luca. So these uh, simply connected wandering domains um, can have um, rather varied um, dynamics instead of just always being in the escaping set. So these domains can be escaping, they can be oscillating, and um, it's a large open question of whether or not they can in fact be bounded. And unlike multiply connected um, wiring domains, where we eventually have some large annuli, uh, these simply connected domains can be very small. And as Luca said, um, they can have, um, uh, well, very, very, um, I guess, different uh, geometry. Um, and yes, so there, there are again, uh, lots of results about uh, simply connected boring domains. And now we're going to, in particular, focus on uh, this result of Luca uh, that he talked about um, in the previous talk. So uh, what is this result? Well, uh, we have, we're going to let u be a bounded simply connected domain such that u is regular and uh, has the basically uh, the closure has connected complement. Um, so by regular uh, here, what we mean is that u is the interior of the closure of u. So as Luca said in his previous talk, we don't want something that looks say like this. Um, so don't want that. Um, so if one has a bounded simply connected domain like this, then there exists a transcendental entire function f for which u is a wandering domain. So uh, Bakhtar proves um, that in fact, and he said before, that this condition of being regular is a necessary condition. And um, after showing this very nice result, he gives the question of whether or not it's true that the closure of any bounded simply connected to two component of entire function 
has a connected complement. And um, our flex of construction, the construction that we have here, uh, gives a negative um, an answer uh, to this question. So how do we uh, obtain our, um, our, our main result? And it's by using, um, well, a generalization of this result of Bakhtal. So um, we have our general um, result, which is that we have some compact set K with connected complement here. Then there exists a transcendental higher function F for which F to the end restricted to K tends to infinity uniformly. The boundary of K is a subset of the Julia set and that K is a wandering compact set. And in particular, every connected component of the interior of K is a wandering domain of F. In fact, simply connected a wandering domain of F. So basically you give your favorite um, compact set with connected complement, whatever it is. And then there exists a transcendental entire function for which basically the boundary of this compact set is a subset of the Julia set. And it's a wandering compact set for which all of the interior connected components are simply connected wandering domains. So in particular, this gives us a, a nice little corollary, which is that we can apply this to say um, polynomial Julia sets. So we're going to let P be a polynomial of degree at least two. Then what we say is that there exists a transcendental entire function F such that the Julia set of this polynomial is a subset of the Julia set of our transcendental entire function. Um, so, so yes, so you pick your favorite um, polynomial uh, and look at its Julia set. Then in fact is a subset exactly as a set of the Julia set of F. Uh, in particular, every bounded two component of P is a simply connected boring domain of F and every connected component of the Julia set is a watering continuum of F. And also that if we restrict um, uh, F to, well, the filled in um, Julia set, then this thing tends to infinity uniformly as n tends to infinity. So you can think of, for instance, the rabbit here. What we have is that for the rabbit, the Julia set um, is going to be a, a subset as a set of some transcendental entire function. And each of these components here will be um, simply connected wandering domains of this transcendental entire function F. So let's map forward and so on. So we're also able to get uh, another result uh, which is related uh, or which is um, more um, counter examples to the strong uh, Aramanko's conjecture. A strong version of Aramenko's conjecture. So in 1989, uh, Aramenko proved that for a transcendental entire function, every connected component of the closure of the escaping set is unbounded. And he asked whether the same um, thing holds for the connected components of the escaping set itself. And this is in general known as Aramenko's conjecture, which is a major open conjecture. and he further asked the following stronger conjecture based on basically path connectedness that can every point of the escaping set be joined to infinity by a curve of points that lie in the escaping set. And so uh, in 2011, um, it, it, they showed that no, uh, that there exists a transcendental entire function. Uh, this is a result of Rempo, Robin, Fusa, Rupert, Schleicher, um, that there exists a transcendental entire function such that every path connected component of the Julia set is in fact bounded. So, however, um, they also showed that this strong conjecture does hold for some large class of transcendental entire functions. This was um, the first uh, main uh, counterexample. Uh, some further counterexamples 
that have appeared later um, are those by Bishop, who showed that this strong version of Aramenko's conjecture fails for transcendental entire functions with even a finite set of singular values, and uh, results of Rempa and Benitez Rempa showing basically that you can have both arc like continua as Julie continua and an example for which every Julie continuum is the so called um, pseudo arc. So you get like this bouquet of pseudo arcs. And so ha, um, what we get is a, um, a new, um, possibly in, in some way simpler um, counterexample, which is that we let K be a continuum with connected confluent. So again, your favorite um, compact connected set with connected confluent. Then there exists a transcendental entire function so that every path connected component of K is a path connected component of the escaping set I of F. So in particular, we can't connect um, K to infinity by a curve that's in I of F. In general, what do we do? So if this is our set K here, it's Basilica um, looking Julia set, um, what do we do? Well, basically what we do is we add on this spiral that accumulates nicely on the boundary of our set K. And then we apply our main construction result to this um, new set. And in doing so, what we obtain is um, that this set K satisfies this, that basically we can't connect K nicely with a curve um, uh, in the escaping set off to infinity. So as a general sketch of our construction, uh, what do we do? Well, um, overall, this construction it follows similarly uh, to uh, Luca's result uh, with, I suppose, two main differences. Uh, the first being that instead of looking at this simply connected domain, now uh, we're changing focus and looking at this compact set. Uh, one thing to mention both, well, here, for this result and for the main result here is it's a compact set. It doesn't need to be connected. So for example, the polynomial that you choose doesn't need to be a polynomial with connected Julia set. It could just be um, one of these that's um, totally disconnected. Okay, so uh, what we do, so first is um, that basically we look at a compact set and second is that basically we use a this more classical version of of uh, Runge's result. So um, we're going to use the following classical version of Runge, which is um, this one here that we're given a compact set such that it has connected complement, and this is where our connected complement is needed for all of these previous results. And we suppose that we have some epsilon such that we have uh, this um, some analog function G on this open neighborhood of our set K. Then what we're saying is basically we can approximate our map G by some map F up to some error epsilon. And so we use this in order to basically obtain uh, a general result on constructing a function with certain properties that we're going to want. In particular, um, properties that give us that we obtain a that this set K is basically wandering and that its boundary is in the Julia set. So to begin with, what we do is we choose some sequences K sub J and L sub J. So we can see over here, we have a K sub zero which is this annulus, then we have, well, this, I guess, um, we want the entire disk. So we want containment, then we have an L sub. So one, then we have K 
case of one, and then we have else two, and so on. So to begin with, we have that case of zero is just in a disk, and we nicely have that L sub J is contained in the interior of K sub J minus one, and that K sub J is contained in the interior of L sub J. And we have that we want the nested sequence of these K sub Js and L sub Js to nicely then have the intersection be this complex set K that we've chosen before. So this complex set, well, both here and in particular, this favorite complex set that we want to appear. So um, what we have is that each of these L sub Js and K sub Js is going to be a finite union of topological disks. So in the case where we have a nice connected set K, we're just going to have our one disk. But if we had um, that this set K wasn't connected, then we have some finite union. And then we're also going to choose some sequence of points that are going to basically uh, limit and accumulate on the boundary of our set K. So we have some sequence of points set here that are accumulating on Yeah, and this is these piece of J's that we have. All right, so once we have this setup, what we then do is we define a sequence of disks and we use the following proposition that we've obtained um, as the limit of a sequence of polynomials using Runge's theorem. So we define the sequence of disks we have this here. And what we say is that there exists a transcendental entire function for which we have that the closure of this is d minus one. We have this guy maps nicely back nicely into itself. And we have that these p's map back here after some point, which I'll explain a bit more in a second. And we also want that on these k's we map forward and we have that f is uh, injective on this case of j um, with the nicely mapping and translating forward. So just to explain this more, we're starting off with our disks. And we have that d minus one nicely maps into itself. So we have in particular that because of the fact that it's nicely mapping into itself, that says that it's contained in some nice attracting basin. So we have some basin here. And in d0, we have our set k that we've chosen before, whatever it is. And we have our sets, these kJs that are nicely nested sets for which their intersection is this set k. So we have to say this is k0, then k1, then k2, then k3, and in between them are these sets L. And what we do is that we map basically by translation, this thing forward, for which we then get f of k and the images up to f of k sub one, and we have these pj's which are accumulating on k 
And each of them is going to, at some point, be mapped to this attracting basin. So they'll, they'll come along for a little bit. So we'll have, some of them will come along, but then at each time we're going to map one of them back to our attracting basin. So just to continue this process, we're translating our set K over here. Here's that two of K with the image of these. So this would be F2 of K2. And we have in here again, the image of our PJs that are accumulating again on our set F2 of K. And so, what we're doing is that at each step, we're basically losing a layer of our K, of our K uh, sub zero, K sub one. We're basically shedding this layer and we're taking our P sub one, P sub two, and mapping it at each time um, after some number of jumps back to our attracting basin. And so in particular, what this gives us is that because of the fact that these P sub Js are limiting on well, K, this tells us that the boundary of K is going to be a subset of the Julia set broadly. Uh, and because of the fact that they're mapping into this attracting basin. And what we're doing is in the end, we're just translating a neighborhood of K through these disks that K starts in D zero and just nicely gets translated through these disks off to infinity. So, um, and in particular, what this will say is that all of the interior components of K are going to be nice, um, simply connected, uh, and they're going to um, domains, and they're going to just wander off to infinity as this nice translation. So that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, some questions or comments from the audience first? Nuria, please. Um, just wondering, wondering, uh, just, just wondering whether uh, when you put the rabbit as a compact set on which you can basically send wandering on the plane, do you have any control or information on the interior dynamics of the orbits? Do you know anything? Can you do whatever you want? Or is this determined by by, by so, your construction? I, I think this is similar to what um, Vaso is asking uh, um, uh, Luca in terms of this mm -hmm. composition of say Blasch the product. Um, I, I think, well, as far as what this construction gives is that just these domains are translated um, to the right. And so one doesn't, I mean, one just has, uh, this is the control. But, um, yes. but here I was just, uh, I mean, since you kind of prescribe what goes on inside, right? I mean, I was wondering whether these dynamics on the rabbit could, re could uh, reproduce the period three orbit that you see in the actual rabbit, because actually you only need to decide which component goes to which somehow, no? Uh, yeah, so this is a very good question. I guess we had thought of it a little bit, um, but as to exactly what what the answer was, I, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if Lhasa has a comment more than I can make, but I, I think that, I mean, I think you could probably use the map, use the rabbit map. Instead of using a translation by two, we use the rabbit map mm -hmm. and and you know, you know the corresponding translation. Mm -hmm. um, and one has to be a little bit careful um, because the map, the map obviously changes. You know, we approximate to the map changes, but because we have this nice polynomial-like 
um, behavior outside actually what we have will still be like a polynomial like map so i think probably we can um i, I, I don't want to you know i i, I would yeah, guess yeah. i would <laughs> guess that you can make that you can make a function which kind of behaves like the rabbit and you can get different types of internal dynamics um as you make your examples more complicated you know for these lakes of water and so on yeah, yeah, yeah. um you have to ask you know what kind of map can you have you probably have to start out with something if you start out with something dynamic like the rabbit, then I think you can do something with the dynamics. But the general ones, like the lakes of water continua, can we make them be, you know, one, one we need to think a little bit more about what we can do with, with respect to the dynamics. But, okay, uh, thank you. Okay, some more questions from the audience. Uh, and uh, from online participants. If not, that uh, let's thank the speaker again.